Well, anyways, hello everybody. Good afternoon. Um, you do have to stay up because stay awake because I, I I'm going to ask you a test. I'll tell you when. I won't tell you what. Anyways, uh, thank you, Dr. Quang, uh, for inviting me. We are fellow, although certainly not the same generation, Indiana University Folklore Institute graduates. Um, and Dr. Quang is on the Florida Folklife um, Council. Um, that's the state-appointed board that advises our state folklorist. And you get a sense of what folklore is if you haven't already. Um, I thank you for inviting me to be part of this um, prestigious symposium. Um, and um, when she gave me this and said, talk about folk culture uh, and traditional culture studies and the humanities, and I thought, well, let's talk about how they intersect, how they crossed. But what I did first was to dissect them and then hopefully we'll see how they cross. Um, intersections. Let me start with an anecdote um, that's filled with intersections. Um, I, it's a little bit personal. I slowly made my way through college in the 1970s. That was hippie days, yes. Um, I painted a flower on my face. It was drop in, drop out. I don't advise that of you guys. Um, I started as a dance major and I was gonna teach ballet. Um, but in my second year, I get very disillusioned. With, Lorna, did you know that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I started, to, um, I got very disillusioned with the program and I dropped out. Uh, a year later and lots of adventures later, I was at Kent State University. Kent State is where in 1944 students were murdered in association with um, protests for the Vietnam War. I was, that was the year before I went. Um, I, um, also found myself displeased with the program I chose to study. At that time, it was costume design. That sounded good. Uh, and I called my mom and I said, well, um, this is it, I'm quitting. And she said, nope. My mother was an International Lady Garment Workers Union sewer and organizer. She came the next day and she took me, you guys can imagine this, to a counselor to figure out what I could do, what they could do to keep me there. Um, what was I interested in? And I don't know where this all came from, textiles, costume design, cultural studies, Middle East, Africa. I created uh, my own individualized interdisciplinary program, which in essence in the 70s was unheard of, was African studies and textiles. Um, so I took, I mined all the relevant courses, literature, history, religious studies, anthropology, cultural geography, and I worked independently with faculty members, and I took hands-on weaving and crafts courses. Yes, my friends all said, she's studying underwater basket weaving. No, I wasn't. Um, almost, but not quite. Two years later, I, I filled with learning and a dance minor, I graduated. Well, my boss, I was working at the theater as the house manager, came up to me. Her husband was an art history professor, and she gave me this book, Folklore and Folklife. Her husband, who graduated in art history from Indiana University, thought I would be great going to, in, to IU for an MA in folklore. I, I took this book home, I read it up and down and backwards and forward, and it was Greek to me which is strange because I'm Greek American, but it was like, what is this about? I gave it back to her, I thanked her. I didn't have a clue what folklore and folk life were, but I did have a job. Um, I went for two years as a Peace Corps volunteer teaching dance in Jamaica. So I used my years of training. One day I was walking home um, and I stopped at the US Information Agency offices and there was the Journal of American Folklore. Ta-da, I remembered. Hmm, Nancy's husband said I should go study folklore, and I did. I applied to Indiana. Um, I didn't go for African studies. Instead, I studied um, immigrant ethnic um, heritage and culture um, and material culture stuff, and the rest is history. So where is this going? As an undergraduate, I was immersed in the world of dance and academic courses and handcrafts. My final two years, I chose right out of the humanities playbook. Humanities, that's what we're talking about. Literature, history, religious studies, art history, anthro, cultural geography. These are the heart of humanities. Um, also, uh, according to some, including performing arts and art history. It turns out my undergraduate interdisciplinary degree was a degree in the humanities with a good measure of fine arts. So, Humanities, we've got this intersection. Um, 
searching the web for the field of humanities, you get all these lists. It can be English, history, religious studies, philosophy, art history. There's another list that has language and literatures, history comes back, religion, philosophy, art history, classics, which I don't even know what that is. It's gone out of fashion. Nobody studies Latin and ancient Greek anymore, I think. Um, and visual and per performing arts. So this adds up to eight items in the list. The humanities were actually studied long ago by the ancient Greeks and other classical era scholars. During the Renaissance, the Studia Humanitatis, or Studies of Humanity, became an in integral part of the European education system. 15th century English, Italian humanists focused on secular literary and scholarly activities like poetry, rhetoric, history, philosophy, the same list. Um, and they felt that that would transform students into educated citizens. Educated citizens, what an interesting concept. The foundation of the humanities places emphasis on thinking about how to think. That's a, a phrase I grew up with. My dad, my parents were New Yorkers, was you're going to college not necessarily to learn, you're learning to learn to think how to think. By learning about how the great thinkers in the past have exercised their brains, students gain knowledge of, and the critical approach to analyze, to expand upon, and challenge the ideas that civilizations of the past were founded on. Through studying the humanities, skills such as assessing and interpreting information are refined. And students learn to think creatively um, while considering different viewpoints um, to develop the capacity for problem solving. These are all key words that we hear today. And to express themselves clearly. The ways of working associated with humanities, such as inquiry, observation, fieldwork, interpretation, encourage critical thinking. That involves all kinds of quote unquote habits of the mind, commitments of sensitivities, that include such things as open mindedness, fair mindedness, the desire for truth, and an inquiring mind. Such qualities are essential in a world where information today can be so easily accessed. Um, but where everyone cannot be sure what information to rely on. Students in the humanities are encouraged to reason, to ask questions, to think creatively and critically. So another really recent, more important aspect of the study of the humanities is the recovery of voices and past lives who either have been ignored or removed from historical nar narratives and literary canons. The humanities take a front seat as our culture is trending toward greater inclusion and recognition of diverse voices, African American, Asian American, Native Americans, women, and so forth, and diverse histories to understand many constituent parts that come together to make a complex world. We're gonna take a journey what in the world does this have to do with Asian studies? Why did Dr. Quang invite me here? So we're gonna go through Korea and we're gonna look at some tidbits of um, literature and language, history, religious studies, art history, these topics that I've thrown out there. Um, students, uh, students and scholars of literature and languages explore communication um, um, between people and how our ideas and thoughts on the human experience are expressed and interpreted. This is Kim byung Seon Satgat, who lived in the 19th century from Yongwal, which is in this beautiful green mountainous center of the peninsula, uh, was one of the most influential poets of humor and satire in the Chosun dynasty. Kim became a, became a vagabond troubadour wandering around Korea making contact with a wide range of people who admired the country's scenic natural beauty. He always wore this satgat, this bamboo hat, on his head as a symbol of self-imposed withdrawal from the light of the sun. Historians and art historians study human social, political, and cultural developments. Historians use the so-called historical method. It's kind of like the scientific method that you answer it with the same words again. Don't you love you look up a dictionary 
definition and it just uses the same words. It's like, well, what does that mean? Anyways, historians gather evidence of, the pa of past events to study change over time. They evaluate the evidence and interpret, I keep using those words, from events that occurred in the past. Ultimately, however, interpreting the past is, a sub is subject to bias of the individual making the conclusions. The results in the possibility of different interpretations of what occurred um, even when different accounts are based upon evidence. And you're going to see throughout this threads of Japanese Korean history, um, which there's different approaches to. So we start with this guy. I call him Admiral Sunshi, Sunshine. Admiral Yi Sun Sin was a Korean military general and a national hero, famed for his victories against the Japanese Navy in the 16th century. Who remembers, I think it's Civil War, the Monitor and the Merrimack? Nobody? One of them was, a, uh, was an ironclad uh, boat to ward off. And, and if you've ever seen the awful Matthew McConaughey movie called Sahara, where they find this boat studied, it's, wa watch that one when you're not studying. It's a funny, but anyway, so the monitor, we, we had an ironclad ship during the world, during Civil War, and I'm not a good Civil War person, but I remember that. So one of his most famous victories was off of Hansan Island in 1592. His famous turtle ship, looks like a turtle, right? Maybe a snapping turtle, if you've seen those, um, was responsible for an overwhelming victory. Its most distinguishable um, um, feature was a dragon-shaped head at the bow that could shoot cannon fire and flames from its mouth. This is 1592, pretty fearsome. Each ship was equipped with five different types of cannons, had a fully covered deck to protect from arrows and musket shots, and so forth. So, history. Jungbuk Palace is the center of Seoul. It's the heart of the Chosun um, dynasty. During the uh, Japanese occupation, they built this huge monument there for their government building. So in the center of Seoul, until, when is it, about 2009, residents had overpowering them this building built by the overlords. And they felt that too. There's a whole uh, study in semiotics that looks at the power of buildings and the built environment on the psyche of people living among them. Well, in 2009, it was replaced with a, rec a facsimile of what was originally a Korean building, taking away this very visual image. So we see history being part of a visual image, of a visual representation uh, in this palace. She, I always call her by she, is the Statue of Peace, which is a memorial of the many, many young Korean women who were stolen away as comfort women or prostitutes in World War II as during, um, during the war. Um, this statue sits, she sits opposite the Japanese embassy uh, in Seoul, actually right around the corner from the palace, um, and is highly symbolic of the, of the weight these victims had, the survivors, for full and formal apology, which only came in 2015. Um, these two artists who produced the seated girl looking at the embassy, um, waiting for closure, you see a bird on her shoulder that represents peace. Um, there's always students and protesters there. You can see the little dog was added. I have a slide. Yeah, you can see the little dog house somebody put for her dog. She's very beloved, and she still remain, remains there even though the apology has come. Philosophy and comparative re, uh, religion. This involves studies of ethics, the meaning of life, the reasons for our thoughts and actions, um, and, and uh, comparative religion leads us to understanding the foundations and the role of practices and beliefs. Questions of faith, ethical dimensions of moral and social understanding are explored by scholars and students. So we have here an unpronounceable temple, please excuse me, um, that's the seat of one branch of Korean Buddhism. 1,000 smiling Buddha statues are seated inside the Thousand Buddha Hall. 
The tiny figures represent the Buddha that is omnipresent any, in any time in the past, present, and future, and that anyone can be Buddha any time, any place. Come on. Oh, this is really heavy, so it doesn't, I, I don't mean heavy. It doesn't move fast. The next image you might see <laughs> is of um, wooden slabs that are carved for printing, be pre predating. Come on, baby. Use your imagination, please. Uh, predating the Gutenberg Press. Um, the Confucianism, um, Chosun, uh, during, from the 1300s to the 20th century, was a Confucian-based society and meticulously captured their family histories, gene genealogies, and stuff on these wooden plat uh, slabs. In order to praise, preserve, and build on the enlightenment of their ancestors, the scholars during Chosun um, and the intellectuals led the publishing of these books using wood blocks, um, in or and they described it as community publishing. There we go, thank you. Um, wood blocks are a timeless treasure that were made to print books. They, um, and they meant much more than just the printing medium, but they follow the descendants through centuries. Here we have a specialist. Art history. Um, art historians study different types and styles of art and artists throughout history. Many art historians look at a piece of art from the perspective of the artist to understand and appreciate the piece better. Uh, through their studies, they're able to see changes and progression of art throughout history. Studying art has also helped to better understand how people in ancient cultures lived. So here we have a 10-story stone pagoda um, that's in the National Museum of Korea, and we have art, art crossing religion, which we actually did with the Thousand Buddhas. Um, this is a, a three-dimensional rendering of the Buddhist concept of the pure land. Each level is decorated with elaborate carvings of Buddhist deities and stories of the Buddhists. Um, it's a document of Korean history, and yet again, here we come to the Japanese occupation, because in 1907, along with many other works of Korean art, this was stolen and taken to Japan. It was returned some years later. Um, this is an incense burner. It's about this tall, the Pakje, pak which is a time period. Gilt bronze incense burner um, from a temple in Puyo towards the south. It would be placed at a Buddhist altar. Again, we have art and religion merging. Um, the pedestal is shaped like a dragon with its front legs extended, and the bowl and lid combine to form an enlarged lotus bud. Um, and what's really funny, how revered it is, we see at Suraksan National Park, which is a site of a Buddhist um, temple, an enlarged sculpture of this same incest burner. Critical and theoretical approaches to visual arts explore historical and philosophic questions and reflect upon the creative process. How in the world, this is a woven textile, it is actually done on, on a machine, um, uh, digitally. And it's steps, it, it's really hard to capture it, it's, it's a staircase. Um, this is pr produced by Do Husa, who was born in Seoul in 1962. He got his BFA, MFA in, um, Korea, then he came to the U.S., studied at Rhode Island School of Design and Yale, and he's known for these intricate car, um, weavings. This is in the National Contemporary Museum of Korea, and you see two buildings. Outside is a row house that he lived in in Baltimore, Maryland. Again, this is woven. It's not, I, I really don't remember, but inside you see a little house. You can see the edge of the roof of the little house representing, one is where he lived when he was in graduate school, one is the house he grew up in. And this kind of house is called a hanok, and you still find areas in Seoul where there are hanoks. And you know, imagine creating this, it's one of my favorite things in the world, that digitally creating this um, as artwork. Um, folk culture, let's move over to the other side. Um, what is folklore? Um, 
folklore has been traditionally and narrowly considered as oral tales. Do you get this when you say you studied folklore? Oh, do you still tell stories? Do you sing songs? Um, I think neither of us do that. Mention folklore, and you'll also hear it's something in the deep past. It's not today, right? So in, um, I'm going to forget the quotes. So I have a way that I define folklore when people ask me, or folk culture. And I say that folklore is traditional culture in the form of aesthetic expressions that are transmitted informally in groups from generation to generation. And it takes several forms, verbal or oral, material, I was going to bring stuff and I forgot to, or ritual and custom. So traditional, so what do we mean here? Ta oral traditions are tales, creation myths, legends. When I taught anthropology um, and I would introduce the idea, I hope this doesn't offend anybody, um, uh, that the Bible, you know, you talk about other people's belief systems being myths, the myths of the Native Americans. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible's a myth. We can look at it that way. You know, I mean, we don't, or creation myths, legends. Okay, do you guys still, Lorna, I don't know if you had this, I think you're too young too, Kentucky Fried Rat? Nobody knows about that. You order, you know, it's late at night, you're studying, your own exams are coming and you order a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken and there's a rat in there. Never. Uh, we've seen this. Okay. I mean, that, that was going around. I mean, Bloody Mary. That's more current. I'm old. <laughs> and did you know Kentucky Fried Rat? Okay, so um, proverbs, jokes, personal experience narratives. Um, material culture can be folk art, vernacular architecture. Who's here from um, Florida? So you know what cracker houses are? Anybody know what a cracker house is? Oh my God. Uh, you know what, go down the road to Christmas. Do you know where Christmas is? There's a little park there all filled with cracker houses. Those are folk houses, they're folk architecture. It's really, I'm gonna stop there. Um, um, <laughs> no, it's really cool. Textiles and dress. I happen to think that t-shirts are the current um, uh, folk costume. See, she's saying that she's at UCF. Um, uh, you know, you have one that has a little alligator, that mean, or whatever it is, and that means you're rich. And, you know, <laughs> what does a t-shirt say about us? I think that is our current folk dress. F recipe, food, traditional food, medicinal, medicinal plants all come under material culture, ritual and custom, marriage, childbirth, childhood, uh, holiday celebrations, and uh, rituals and customs go on and on. Why do we study folklore? We're stuck with that slide. Folk and traditional culture persists within groups. Remember that was one of the words in that, in that, um, that list I gave you. Um, because it validates culture, you've got your UCF and let's say that you're somewhere out of Florida and somebody else has a UCF. It's like, oh, you have something in common. You have identity in common. Uh, maybe they got a, who knows, whatever. It, it educates, it maintains conformity. Through the study of folk and traditional culture, we gain wisdom to understand the moments, from, these moments from different points of view. It, our problems and successes are showcased um, through different periods in history. And um, furthermore, folklore is studied because it's alive and well around us. There's, I, I should have told him we were coming. There's a guy here who does skateboarding. And the, the, the building of skateboard architecture is all based on how you use the skateboard. I, this is out of my realm. But it's a group, is the skateboarders. How do they learn to do these tricks or moves or whatever? By watching each other, to learn it informally. If there's not a book, you might watch a YouTube. But the, the folklore is today. It's not a thing of the past only. Addition, and what happens is that Things are added to it, it's changed, it's transformed. There's continuity and change in new topics from Kentucky Fried Rat to Bloody Mary, to Picabra, uh, and especially here, we live in Florida. I grew up in Pennsylvania and Ohio, and I mean, certainly when I grew up, there was no Chupicabra, but we have such a Latin um, population here that everybody knows, who Ch I think, a lot of people know who Chupicabra is. But, you know, but 
it, so it changes and there's new topics. New materials are used to, bit, to create material objects. Um, and so the genres of folklore continue to connect people in groups. Um, so let's go back to Korea, I think. Yes, here we are. So oral tradition. Other genres of folklore are often part of oral tradition. You usually don't have a storyteller. Well, and I'm sorry guys, my opinion, these people who go around telling stories, you know, like I could tell you stories of Native Americans, but I'm not Native American, so it's not my stories. I can tell you stories of the hoja, that's my, my tradition. But um, when do you tell stories? Either like after Thanksgiving, or after Christmas, or whatever holiday you celebrate. Or around, you know, when, the little, when you're putting your children to sleep, your grandchildren, you're not there yet, you tell them stories. So it's happening at other times that all make it into an event. So nongak, you see that word up there, is a form of traditional peasant music usually performed in an open area of the village with drums and gongs combined with dancing and acrobatics. It was originally played as part of farm work on rural holidays and in shamanistic rituals. Characteristics of Imsil Nongak, Imsil is a certain town, um, include performers who execute movements to increase their excitement and real, reveal artistic skills. Notice the colors um, that they're wearing because color symbolism is associated with shamanism, which is the only national religion or religious belief in Korea. Everything else was imported. Yellow represents humanity, red the earth, and blue the heavens. All of these affect one another and must be kept in balance. So you're gonna see, the, you're gonna see them in other areas too. And look, here's our poet. He came to see the performance. Remember the guy with the hat when we talked about literature? So this uh, folk dance, which is performed in the town of Tonyang, which is way southwest, is the five clowns. It's a series of narratives. Five characters wear five different masks in five different acts. And there's variation is in the part of the drama. You're going to see the leper. This guy with the spots in his face is the leper. There's also aristocrats, monks, who act out their own theme. Uh, several chapters uh, occur. And there's a ritual dance for exorcism. So that brings in shamanism, brings in faith. Now, the, the nobleman enters the story as a leper and goes throughout. At the end, he's threatened by Yongno, this monster, a legendary beast, who must devour a hundred noblemen before returning to heaven and turning into a dragon. Another mass drama is the Hahe mass drama performed um, that's been handed down from in the village of Hahe, uh, which is near, it's an eastern part of the peninsula. It's a typical mask dance performed as part of shamanistic rituals again. It doesn't stand alone. You know, there's oral tradition, in it, there's movement, there's dress, there's a ritual uh, belief underlying it. And it's praying to the local guardian gods for the well-being of the village and a bountiful harvest. It's one of the oldest mass dramas known. And there's actually a story to it, but I don't have time to say it. Well, there's a carver and he wants to carve these, but he has to have no contact with anybody else. And at the very end, a young woman who's very curious peeks in and he dies, and she commits suicide. And that's how this thing happened. So the characters that perform are the bride, the nobleman, the old woman, the monk, the scholar, the flirt. Here we go. The guy on the left is the butcher, who we'll see right here, um, and the butcher. Now, the butcher makes fun of the nobleman and the scholar because they want to buy the bull's testicles, which are aphrodisiac. And that's what he's offering in his hands um, by these. There's another dimension to this. Okay, so this is oral tradition. It's performance. 
It's related to faith, religion. It has dress to it, but there's also the masks. Hahe masks um, are, are aesthetically valued as wooden sculptures. Each has its distinctive characteristics. In other dance performances, which I've not had the privilege to see, the masks are burned. These are not. Um, they're, they're kept. Um, and there are traditional craftspeople who make the masks and are recognized for it. Well, that's material culture, so let's go to material culture. Um, stuff. These are Minwa, uh, Korean folk paintings that are considered uh, traditional depictions created by unknown artists. That's another thing about most folklore is it's usually no author. You know, we don't know who wrote the song. We don't know who created the dance. We don't know who made the dress or the original one. Um, so these paintings are unknown artists with no formal training. Remember I said informal? That was one of my words when I had my definition there. Because you don't learn to do this at school. If I went, I, my example is always if I go to the garden center and learn how to make um, corn husk dolls, which are really folky. That doesn't make me a folk artist because it's not from my tradition. It, it's folk style, but it's not folk art. So these Hojak Do paintings, the tiger is Ho, and he's a protective symbol, um, uh, a symbol of the deities of the mountains and an image of power and strength. Jack is the magpie, brings good news. On the first day of the new year, these paintings would be put on the gates outside of the houses. And so it says, there was once a tiger that had wandered into a big puddle in the forest. Incapable of freeing himself, the tiger anxiously awaited for someone to rescue him. After many days without eating, a good-natured woodcutter passed by um, the muddy puddle and the tiger. The tiger begged the man to save his life. The woodcutter obliged and the ungrateful tiger attempted to eat him. Well, he was hungry. Well, the woodcutter asked the, an ox and a pine tree to judge the situation. They sided with the tiger, urging the tiger to eat the woodcutter. The magpie asked the wood, uh, the, the magpie was asked, wait, the, the woodcutter turned to the magpie, and the magpie asked the woodcutter and the tiger to reenact the scene. So the tiger went back to the puddle and got stuck, and the woodcutter left. <laughs> so we have magpie and the tiger. Folk painting based on oral tradition. We travel now to Jeju Island, which is in the south of Korea. It's, a very, it's actually now a very um, resort, lots of golf courses. Uh, Dr. Quang mentioned museums. There's lots of real museums there. There's also lots of touristy, Instagrammable museums there. Um, and um, there's also, a, 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 the, the people of Jeju are fiercely independent and there's World War II Korean War history there that, that is really reprehensible. But we're not talking about that. Architecture, Jeju Island is a volcanic island in the center of the island is a still active volcano, but it hasn't erupted for a long time. And these thatched roof houses are unique, found only in, um, on Jeju. Um, the walls are made from the volcanic rock, that's what's there, and the roof is covered with straw that's held down by thick ropes, you can see, um, in a checkerboard pattern. This tradition grew out of the need to protect their homes from rain and wind on the island. In the winter, it's ferocious, and the winds come out of the China Sea, I guess, and lots and lots of rain. Um, another thing, on, another aspect in, on Jeju are the Haneyeo. The, the diving ladies. These uh, date to the 17th century. They're ladies who dive into the sea. It's actually what we call free diving. They don't have breathing devices or anything. Um, and in, in the 17th century, the men went to sea or to war, and they didn't come back. And the women had to raise the children. They had to take care of fishing, farming, and raising the animals. And they started harvesting the seabed for abalone, clams, seaweed. I had oysters that the oysters were this big, not just the shell, Un unbelievable. Um, and by the 1970s, in the past, the ladies wore simple cotton clothing. Um, this water is cold. It's, it's like the, the uh, Pacific compared to the Atlantic because the Pacific's cold. 
In the 1970s, they started wearing wetsuits. Um, they are dying out, but there are training schools. And ladies, you can go to Korea and train to be a honey ayo. Uh, there are women coming from all over the world to do this. Um, here they are. We ladies got an octopus. We're eating octopus. Um, this is Boteok. This is a small, round, walled shelter, uh, folk architecture, traditional architecture. It's where the Haniyeo changed into and out of their diving gear or rested and warmed themselves by a fire. It's usually a four-sided wall structure, again, lava rocks, um, uh, to, to, to um, keep you away, block the wind. Um, um, these are no longer being used because the ladies wear wetsuits and there's more um, changing rooms for them. And they're not, they're not found as commonly around the island. Let's go to faith, ritual and custom. This is Korean shamanism, is one of the many religious, as I said, it's the only native belief system in the peninsula. There's Confucianism, Buddhism, Christianity, and I don't know what else. But the shaman tradition predates them all. The shaman in Korea and elsewhere, shamans exist in many, many societies, um, maybe called something else, but they are shamans, are a, a bridge between the spirit world and the earthly world. Excuse me. Um, they're religious specialists who are perceived as being able to deal directly with spirits on behalf of the community. The spirits can be deceased ancestors. They can be figures like Buddha and Jesus. They can be recently deceased political leaders. I was taken to a shaman, I and two other colleagues, and it, it was north of Seoul. And there were all these photos of 19th and 20th century religious political figures who are now godly to this shaman. Um, um, and the, 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 the spirits interact with people and cause good fortune and pain and misfortune. And the shaman can figure out who it is and what to do about them. Um, so traditionally, uh, they will perform a ceremony called a gut. And there's a variety of guts, whether you want good harvest, the death of a loved one, initiation, or so forth. We're back in Jeju now. Remember I said look for the colors, because you see again the red, blue, the yellow. Um, and um, also this shaman has a, a distinctive hat. They often do. As you're walking along paths in Korea, you're in, uh, people love to hike there. On Sunday, the, the, the subways in Seoul are filled with people like me, my age, with their hiking clothes on, and, and they go for miles. It's really remarkable. But anyways, you're on a hiking trail, on a beach, in a, in a national park, near a temple, you'll see these little piles of rocks. These are called stone pagodas. Koreans have traditionally worshipped mountain gods even before religion emerged. Perhaps they began to build stone pagodas on the mountain, making wishes to the gods. Now they put them wherever they can be. This is Hwamsa Temple, and you can see this fountain here, and yet there's a couple stone pagodas in that site. Um, and you just either start your own or you add to it, praying for good luck, health, and happiness. That's the usual thing. Rope tugs of war. So one of the, the products of Korea is rice, and it's one of the staples of the food thing. So this tug of war festival traces back some five centuries when people in agricultural communities uh, were praying for abundant harvest for that year. With the detritus from the, the rice fields, they build these ropes that can be over 600 feet long, three feet wide. You can imagine how heavy they are. Uh, hundreds of contenders are grouped um, on two teams and pull vigorously with the, trick, the thick rope to dislodge each other. Uh, the tug of war promotes a sense of community and unity. Not, it's not who matters who wins or loses. If the male side wins, it said it would bring peace to the country. If the female wins, it will attract prosperity and uh, fertility. So I gave you my definition of folklore. Does anybody remember, did you take notes or it's on your little handheld thing, what my um, 
components were of folklore? Okay. And you said something about like how it's like something about aesthetics as well. It has to, if it's not aesthetic, why in the world would you do it? If it doesn't look nice or please you. And it's taught informally. Taught informally? Anybody yeah? Generation to generation. Let's put this all together. Who's eaten kimchi? What is kimchi? Fermented, Fermented cabbage. Fermented cabbage. Ah, that's what you think. So, kimchi, we're going to put this all together. Traditional, taught informally, generation to generation, aesthetic. Well, the aesthetic here is the taste, and it has to look right, too. Food, what do they say? Um, it has to look good to your eyes or you won't eat it. So that's among the components of folklore. So kimchi is traditional fermented dish. Uh, that has been an integral part of Korean culture for thousands of years. Now, in Eastern Europe, they, they don't ferment, but they preserve cabbage over the winter because in both places, there's harsh winters, there's not a lot of vegetables, fresh vegetables, and so you preserve them so that you have this. Um, over time in Korea, spices and seasoning, including red chili, this is the, the on the left is a rice field, on the top is um, cabbage is growing, and I don't remember what that is, but you can also see the rice fields here, um, just to get a s sense of that. Every spot of land has stuff growing. Um, so what goes into it? Spices and seeding and seasoning. Red chili powder, garlic, ginger, green onion, fermented seafood or fish sauce, peppers and chili peppers. So you see the chili peppers growing? It's, it's interesting. Um, Peppers generally are one of those foods that is a, a, a Western Hemisphere. I hate the word New World. Think about it. How many indigenous people were living in North America, in the North American continent, when the Europeans came? Well, and South America. That was their world, so why is this a New World? And I prefer to say the Americas, Western Hemisphere, because to the people who are descendants of those indigenous people, it's not a new world. I get weird like that. L Lorna knows that. <laughs> She's been exposed to me. Um, anyways, um, generally thought uh, peppers are a, 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 a Western Hemisphere food. And I think about, you know, what was Hungarian food be like or Italian food be like, Chinese food be like without peppers? Actually, there was an indigenous um, a cultivar in Korea that is dated back to 2,000 years. So they did have some sort of capsicum pepper. Um, originally, kimchi was made of radishes and other vegetables. Um, um, cabbage kimchi is thought to have been developed in the 19th century. We do find it, though, in literature. So there's a Chinese writing from the third century of this era. The people of Gogoryeo, which is a, an older civilization, were very good at making fermented foods such as wine, soybean paste, and some sort of salted and, and fermented fish. Uh, fish. Chosun, I mentioned, uh, there's a writing that says, radish pickle in soy sauce is good for three months in winter. In summer, salted cabbage for nine months in winter. So we have a history of this. Um, now, what's really cool is group. That was one of the words I think none of you said, is that folk culture exists in groups. It's not just out there. And there's a special event dedicated to making kimchi called kimjang, where large events, uh, large amounts of kimchi are prepared to be consumed for the winter. It's a communal activity, involves many participants, and, it's, and it can also be on a small scale family to large scale community. I just read something in the New York Times, you know, an essay of a woman who was Korean American, second generation. She was, she was living like in New York, her family was in LA, and she was missing kimchi, and she had a handful of friends, of this, and they all get together, and they had a kimjang. And she started to do it with her friends every year now, in New York. So continuity, the group, they learned informally. Um, um, so 
this, this festival um, is actually the third main festival after the Thanksgiving and the Lunar New Year in Korea. Um, now, how do we get to this? We're, I said we're gonna cross lines. Uh, kimchi is usually prepared in, or preserved in these ceramic jars. If you watch MASH reruns on MeTV, it's a different channel here than in Florida, every night at seven o'clock. Um, the jars are buried in the ground and the bacteria actively grows and ferments at that temperature. Ongi pottery is a glazed utilitarian earthware used in everyday life um, to preserve this. And, and you see these factories or where it's being commercially made, it's still stored in traditional pottery. Um, historically, these were important items in the traditional homes family routine. People usually had, and I mean, you see this everywhere, wherever you go across the country, groups of larger ongi in the yard. Um, even with the apartment buildings, they somehow get them, or they're using now more plastic. So where do we get these from? We have the potters. Ongi potters uh, use long slabs of clay working on the wheel to produce these huge, huge, huge pots. And then they're fired in these really strange earthenware kiln. It's like on the side of a hill built into the, into the soil. And you can see the fire coming out from these apertures where they're fired um, and glazed. Um, this is at the pet factory. And then what in the world do we do with the ongi pottery? We have a dinner and we have uh, uh, decanters. We have all the dinnerware and everything uh, with ongi pottery. So I tried to tie ritualism, ritual and belief, oral tradition, material culture uh, into kimchi. So we've gone all over Korea, although you didn't know that. We went up to Sokcho, we went to Andong, Seoul, the southern part of the island, to Je of the peninsula to Jeju Island. Um, clearly, I think clearly from these multiple examples of various domains drawn from humanities studies and folk culture and traditional culture studies in Korea, you can see they cross and intersect. Um, one could even say they're really related. The rub lies in the choice of direction taken by the student or the sculptor or the scholar. One may choose to take what can be considered a formal route, studying literature, history, art history, religious studies, or they could go through studying the informal transmission, I mean, it's, it's still a formal study, of folk culture studies, material and customary domains and so forth. The vast realm, and I hope this shows up, of traditional and verbal arts um, are simply another form of literature. So the, the mask play, the, the formal poet. Often the study of traditional cultures relies on a synchronic, synchronic approach to provide and detect uh, continuity and change. Uh, research in philosophy and religion, I didn't show you these guys because I was concerned about time. These are guardian spirits that are found in front of most of the, the villages throughout the country. In um, Jeju, remember that it's a lava rock island, they're lava rock figures. Um, just so you, you just say you hadn't seen that. Um, and also art history and folk art cross lines with this formally trained structural artist, fine artist, re replicating a folk architecture within his one piece. Um, and yet, remember, that there's a distinction between students and scholars who pursue humanities and folklorists, and that's primary source material. Where do we get what we study? The humanities scholar usually looks at written texts, uh, primary source material. You're getting bam bombarded with that. We've got to do research in primary source material and not Wikipedia. Folklorists find their topics in context. What does that mean? with living people. We have to go to people and ask them. I actually had, was a part of a research project in New Mexico, and the question was, were tombstones, the art, the engravings on tombstones, did that indicate a Jewish heritage of the person buried there? And I said, well, 
you have to find the family of the person buried there and talk to them because the tombstone does not talk. And my historian colleague, who's amazing, was like, oh, you're right. Um, the cultural heritage reveals constructions of identity, presentations of self, strategies of control or resistance, like all this stuff with Japan, manipulations of resources, and examples of virtuosity, if you think back to those beautifully carved masks. Um, supporting research is also, folklorists also use textual, textural um, sources in order to go to these old sources that talk to the an antiquity of kimchi, um, to learn about other things, to base it into uh, the history. Conversely, humanities and other social sciences that rely on analytical and interpretive approaches could benefit from living, f learning from the living world. Area and global studies in the public education fills a need for the development critical, of critical thoughts, ideas, and interpretations on the development and interaction of the humanities. So much remains to be learned about the geographical concept, conceptual area known as Asia, which you've been immersed in this semester, and we'll be getting a bunch more. There's lots of misrepresentations of Asians, Asians, Americans. We no longer see Orientals. If you say Orientals, if you want to treat, again, look up. It might be on Hulu. Oh, gosh. Flower Drum Song. It's an Oscar Hammerstein, Richard Rogers, Oklahoma, and all of those uh, play, movie. And, and think about how, what, what's represented there. Flower Drum Song. Um, the end game of both is the promotion of cultural awareness and mutual understanding. One scholar wrote, the calling of the humanities is to make us truly human in the sense of the word. Folk and cultural studies should be embedded in that statement. So wherever you look at on this superhighway, the intersections we've been looking at, there's a critical need for folk and traditional studies in the major components of humanities. Thank you. Everybody's awake. I'm so happy. Any questions? Can I entertain? So um, you were talking about like that statue of peace, and you showed us the picture that uh, that actually reminded me, like when you were giving the backstory of like there was like Filipino soldiers who fought in the Korean War. Have you seen that statue? I have not. There's a professor at the University of Miami, I can see her right in front of me, and I think her last name's Galang, and she's doing a lot of study um, on, and, and interviewing the comfort women, the remaining women in the Philippines that were forced into prostitution. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, Evelyn Galang is her name. Yeah. So I've got uh, two questions. First, the second one is you know the one that really matters. But uh, at the beginning, you said you were Greek. Uh, where are you from? Epirus. Oh, nice. I'm from Crete. And we're um, Greek Jews. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, the second question relates to that. Uh, I'm a Greek folk dancer. I've been for quite a long while, and uh, as far as the training goes for it, it's uh, very formal. And you know the, what you were saying about how it's you know informal, passed down orally, and you know things of that nature is you know I just wanted to ask how does your approach to what defines folk culture influence your findings on it? Where did you grow up? Uh, Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale. Okay. Did you learn? Did you start at Greek school to learn dancing? Uh, through, I go to a Greek Orthodox church, yeah. and I learned to dance through there. Okay, so the Greek Americans have set up a system, actually ha as have Lithuanians, Hungarians, and several other European ethnic groups, uh, immigrant groups, of after day school for learning language, learning religion, and learning culture. I went to Greek school till I was in sixth grade because my mother wanted me to learn Greek even though I'm not Orthodox. And we always went to the basement and learned Greek dancing. It's a real difficult thing of what to do with these recreations, because that's kind of what it is, except that this is in a new context. You're not in Greece, or imagine whatever country you're in, Philippines, wherever. 
you're not at the wedding, the baby naming, at the party, and getting up as a little kid and learning how to dance. You're in the church basement uh, learning how to dance. But it's still informal because the context has changed. And remember I said one of the pieces, it's not in my definition, of folk culture is that it changes because it responds to different um, uh, influences and impetuses. Um, if you grew up in Tarpon, I think there'd be a lot more chances for weddings and baby namings and things where there is a sizable Greek American community. But learning in the church basement um, is, consider, is, is really informal learning. Even if it's for an objective to perform? That's a real dilemma too, is you know, um, I, I also had the opportunity, it's on, um, it's a very bad quality film, but it's on, um, you can find it on, on, under Cleveland State University, called A Step in Time. And we took three communities in Cleveland, the Irish community, the Slovenian community, and the Greek community, and the idea was to film them dancing informally. Um, the Irish are, the Slovenians are at festival, the Greeks are at festival, but the Greeks are also at the Cretan picnic, because they have a Cretan picnic every 4th of July that people come from all over, and uh, from Thessaly, I think, picnic, um, or, and, and dancing there. So if you dance, I mean, it's all changed now, because we have festivals, and ethnic communities dance at festivals, so does that count? And it depends how you frame it as a scholar. Th that's a wishy-washy answer, because it all depends. But yeah. it, it, it is the transformation of folk culture in the, in, in the diaspora, because it's the same with Greek communities in Australia, or the multiple immigrant communities that populate Australia, New Zealand, the whole world now. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? I think you have to come this way. Um, hi. Um, so I know you said that folklore is uh, very informal. Um, and I know you said like, not to look on Wikipedia and stuff like that. Um, but do you think that in a way that um, online creation um, and people collaborating is a form of folklore? So in maintaining Wikipedia, could that be considered folklore? Because even though someone might not know about it, they might be talking to someone who's like, oh, I was there. Or like, oh, I've read a lot about it. Or, oh, I saw this. Oh, I saw that. Like, um, and just like people in general who make stuff like long form video essays or, or art or writing or stuff, do you think that could be considered like our modern day folklore that we um, interact with a lot? OK, so what we're looking at is transmission. How is it being passed along? And we live in a cyber world. Actually, I, I sent my paper to a colleague, an anthropologist, who's done a lot of work in Korea. And he, one of his notes was, what about d digital stuff? Which I totally ignored. I didn't want to go there. And you know, I mean, during COVID, everybody learned how to cook from watching YouTube. And there's a lot of ethnic cooking, you know, at, uh, whatever, on YouTube. And this is a whole new world. And Luckily, I don't teach folklore, so my little blinders, I don't like the word silo, but you know, blinders are what a horse has so it doesn't see right or left. I have my little blinders, and this is the way I see the world. But these are certainly questions that folklorists are asking and answering. And as I said to your classmate, if you make a case for it that you support well, don't kill me, Dr. Quang, then you're supporting it and saying why you think this is folklore. Does that make sense to you? You know, I might not agree with you, but there's so many different opinions out there and ways of approaching. Um, but it, there's also a really fuzzy topic, and that is between traditional culture folklore and pop culture. And pop culture is more transient, whereas traditional culture changing continues. So again, uh, there's so much going on digitally that people are studying, that are considering, um, that it's being accepted as traditional culture, a new traditional culture. Yeah. 
museum studies. So my museum studies are straight line museum studies. And what I look at in teaching museum studies is two things. One is that there's an intellectual basis to it. And second, that it's a practical thing. There are skills to learn. So that when I would teach, also the students at, at FIU came from many different backgrounds and also were looking to work in different areas. So that my teaching also tried to address their desires. So that when it came time to write a paper, if you were interested in museum education and you were interested in digital approaches, and he is looking at something on his computer, was interested in curatorial, I would tell you, do your research and write your papers about those topics on whatever theme works, so that you could expand your knowledge. Um, and I try to have my students delve into the history of the museum practice so they knew where it came from. Because I'd gone to na in national meetings or international meetings and somebody would report on my museum bus that goes around to all the communities that are underserved. It's like, well, 20 years ago, this museum here was doing that. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, research into it. So knowing the underpinnings, but then also learning how do you do museum education? How do you approach curatorial? What in the world is out there digitally to be doing, which I don't know anything about. Um, so um, there's general survey courses that I've taught that try to get students to do practical and intellectual. Because once you start working, and this is a very bad opinion, there's a lot being written about museum studies by anthropologists and historians who've never worked in a museum. And I feel they don't know what it is to be in the trenches. When you're in the trenches and you're curating an exhibit or you're developing it public programs to go with the current exhibit, you have no time to write the theory behind how you're doing this. You can write a case study, practical, but you're not going to research educationally what goes into this. You're, you're creating it. And um, so I think it's really important for students to get hands on, to learn how to do it, but also know the history. And, and what's preceded, and what else has been done, and on a global view. Because there's so much going on around the world that's really remarkable. So that's how I've taught. And in the position I was in, I taught the two introductory courses, and I actually asked curators and educators, registrars, the individuals who care for the collections, who keep records on the collections. It is a very um, anal profession. Um, I, I, we all know libraries, and of course you guys don't know, my dear, you do the, the library catalog cards, it's all done digitally. But those kind of records are kept, and have to be kept. I don't know if you've read, the British Museum recently found out that some thousands of pieces have been stolen. When I worked in the Children's Museum and I, I'd go down in the storage to get pieces to be cataloging, to create the records, and I'd look at the it was never precious jewelry. It was like, oh, I like that coral necklace. It was like, oh, I could take this and nobody would know. But it was like, that's why it's there, because it's being preserved for the public, not for me to take. Um, but there's, it's a record-keeping, um, um, uh, really paperworking. Um, I think a student once asked me what was the skill that I learned that I used the most working in a museum, and it's writing. It's not just record keeping as such, but you're writing reports, you're writing grant proposals, um, um, you're following up, you're writing press releases, you're doing marketing, um, you're writing exhibit labels. So what you're learning now for writing, I think no matter where you go, is gonna serve you. So I, that was really airy-fairy, but. What's your opinion on the idea of, um, since the world's going towards a more digital future, with um, museums kind of providing their catalogs, um, via digitally, so people can, all, people can access them rather than having to go to a museum themselves. And I'll also extend that to, um, I know some museums are experimenting currently with uh, VR. Um. Oh, they've been doing VR for a long time. The Dresden Museum in um, Dresden, Germany, you could go through, and I was Annie, I forget if I was Annie Avocado, that was my second life, whatever you call that person thingy. 
Um, and but. Um, I don't, I, I think it's really cool to get, and it costs a lot of money, and to get collections accessible digitally, you know, so that if you're doing research or whatever, and, and I pull up stuff digitally. I use that because I'm in Miami Beach, Florida. I can't be going here and there. Um, I don't know if somebody is preparing a visit to Chicago and they pull up Chicago Art Institute. Do they then go to see those art pieces or do they just say, well, I saw it online, I don't need to go see it. And I don't know if any study has ever been done to correlate that. Um, and this is not a direct answer to you, but I was an exhibit developer at the Oklahoma Museum of Natural History doing the Native American anthropology, archaeology exhibits. And our exhibit design firm had said, well, we could do this all digitally. And my boss, who was really a yuck boss, said in his best voice, you know, we have the real stuff. People want to see the real stuff. We're not doing digital. Because people want to see this stuff. I, I think there's a lot um, out there that digital resources can serve and can serve different publics, but we're still based on the real stuff. And there's nothing like, I, I think that, Lorna, do they still use the Janssen book for art history? Close, yeah. yeah. I grew up with Janssen, and you knew what Janssen was, but there's like three women artists in the whole book. I didn't realize that in the 70s, because you just don't look, and it's like, hmm. But I remember in Janssen there was a sculpture uh, from Iraq, uh, from Mesopotamia or something. And when I saw it in the British Museum, it was like, wow. You know, it, digital is, is fabulous. It opens a lot of doors. It allows access. But there's still the real thing. Um, my question is semi-related. Semi, ever so slightly. Um, you mentioned the British Museum. And the British Museum and theft are often associated with one another, at least in terms of cultural centerpieces or very significant pieces of history from certain nations, right? Recently, there has been a reckoning of countries demanding for their relics and their history back, essentially. Now, <clears throat> how does like, the dispositioning of cultural artifacts affect the way it's studied? and affect the attitudes of, for example, like a home country in regards to the study of their culture in another land. And the, the follow-up question was, with going digital, this brings up a huge issue with ownership in regards to the digital assets of these real-world historical pieces. Would there be a financial incentive for the home nation to allow their pieces of culture to be displayed digitally? Because again, it's like, th these things are very expensive, but who's charging? You know, it's the people who rightfully have ownership of these items. Mm -hmm. How would we go about that? First of all, I hate the term decolonialization. I really do. Yeah. Um, but I've also had the privilege of working with Indian people, Native Americans, and stepping back for their voice, because that's why they were there. I was not there to interpret their voice. Their voice was their voice. How did the vast collections get around the world is a big story, a big history. It has to do with a, a economic, political, um, colonial expansion. Uh, it has to do with denying uh, national rights to more of the world than Europe. However, on the other hand, when Napoleon went across Europe, he looted all sorts of stuff from the European countries, and they're in the Louvre, and there's very little demand to send them back. Whatever. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a very complex question of what was really happening, not what was really happening, there is no question. It was colonialism, it was greediness, um, and so forth, and it was great white father. And I'm sorry, it was great white father, we can protect this better than you can. 
and this will build us up as a nation to have these wonderful treasures here. Um, and now there's the burden of the white man that now we have to do this right, you know, and I won't feel good until I do it right. Um, about 20 years ago in the International Council of Museums, 20, 30 years ago, there was a lot of talk about repatriation around the globe, not Native American repatriation. And the question was, um, do, the, do they have museums and the way to preserve this stuff? We do, well, so much so for the British Museum. And whatever museums, um, do they have the means to preserve them? There is actually a dilemma in China. Um, it was 2007, 2010, about 2010, the triennial of the International Council of Museums was in Shanghai. And in the three years leading up to that, China built, excuse me, a shitload of, sorry, Len, Dr. Quang, a shitload of new museums. And you'd go in them and you'd see water damage coming in because they were not well built. The, and, and, and the exhibits were also all kind of cookie cutter. In Korea, the museums, you always see these little dioramas. Um, so could you send stuff back to these conditions? Many, uh, I'm saying this, I don't necessarily believe it, but it's arguments. Many of places, so now um, pre-Columbian materials are being sent back to different South American, Central American countries where we don't know if the, the oligarchs are going to steal them and put them on the market secretly so they're in private collections and the public never sees them again. Are they, or are the drug lords? I mean, I'm, these are words that are around there. Um, I don't believe that stuff, but I don't know what I believe. You know, in, in each case is very individualized. Um, there are, museums are money pits, no matter how you term it. And um, there is the debate of how much income comes from admissions compared to other sources. Um, so museums are money pits. When you have a big mega traveling exhibit, do you charge to let your pieces go in that mega traveling exhibit or not? It's giving you publicity. People then know I need to go there to see other things. Do you charge to go in partnership? And what is happening between some European museums and non-European museums is partnerships. So it's half a year here or five years here, they're five years there. And there's no charging because there's also shipping and care and handling that has to be covered. Um, and, and this is not a money-making thing. We're non-profit corporations. We're not there to make for business. Um, but I think one of the main solutions is this sharing um, situations. What's going to happen to the marbles, the Parthenon marbles at the British Museum will never be answered, I think. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I think well, it's time to... Have, I have students that ask difficult questions. They ask fabulous. No, they ask fabulous yes. questions. Yes. It reflects on right. their instruction. Yes. I thank you so much for your attention. Um, it was a thrill to be with you, and I hope this was. Thank you.